Muchísimas gracias de nuevo. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you this afternoon. Um, if you could please present yourselves and let us know where we are today. I'm Ofelia Esparza. Uh, we are at uh, our studio, Tonali Studio in East Los Angeles in Old Town Maravilla, uh, the place where I was born and where I still live. We're part of this community and I'm here with my daughter, Rosana. I'm Rosana Esparza Ahrens, I'm Ophelia's daughter. And uh, my mother and I, along with my sister and another colleague, um, brought this place together, this art space called Donali Studio, and then a little boutique next door, Colibri Boutique, here in East LA. And we're happy to be here. Thank you very much. Once again, we're here with Senora Ophelia and her daughter, Rosana. Um, who are the famed doñas of um, altar making with, along with her family. If you could tell us a little bit of the history um, before we begin about the importance of altares and ofrendas for Dia de los Muertos. Well, I feel it's very important <clears throat> through this tradition. Um, first of all, you remember you're honoring your ancestors, your loved ones. And I say we honor them not how they died, but how they lived and how they were loved. And that is how I learned about my ancestors. My mother, it was like her mission for us, for me and my sisters to, to know who her mama Pola was, who her mother Consuelo was, who her uh, great grandfather, uh, uh, Justo Tinoco, I knew his name. Now, it was like as if I knew mama Pola, I, although I never met her, but she was, I knew her intimately through my mother's stories, and it was important for her to talk about her, how she disciplined her, how she taught her how to cook and uh, work. And so this, this tradition of altares bridges generations, bridges countries, not borders, and even cultures. But most of all, it's a way of keeping your knowing your history, knowing who you are, and what a legacy of remembrance that we all have or can have. And to know that you're cherished even after death is, uh, is quite powerful. Your, your existence has meaning more than, uh, you know, in addition to your life with your, fa with your family. And could you tell me a little bit about your experience learning about altares and growing up? Yeah, um, as, as a young child, you know, we, we had several altares. I, I lived with my grandmother as a young baby. There's nine children. I just want to let you know my mom has nine children and I'm the middle one, the first girl. And uh, so I had four older brothers and they lived in a really small house. And so when I came along, um, I ended up living with my grandmother. So that experience of living with her, you know, the altar was really important. They, they weren't as big and, and monumental as uh, many of my mom's uh, pieces, but they were very personal and, uh, and, and they were in little, you know, little spots, you know. The big ones that were monumental in the house, you know, you had to clear out the whole patio or part of the living room to make a nacimiento, which is, is an ofrenda, it's an altar. And, um, and for Easter, everything would be decorated. So that tradition is, you know, something I remember as a very small child. And, and um, you know, and so we, there's always this, this um, storytelling that happens you know my grandmother was very uh, colorful when she talked about her mother her brothers her her father her her mama pola you know so not only in the stories but when you look at pictures and stuff so on day of the dead that when my mom talks about bridging generations it's like you it's like you're meeting them, you know, uh, you know about their life, what they, you know, how she rolled a cigarette or, you know, something like that. You know, it's, it's very alive in my, in my own memory and in my experience. Although I, you know, she died long in the 30s, you know, long before I was born. So, 
uh, the altar is is a way for the family to stay intact, even though we're not physically together, we're still a family, you know, and we, we have this communication and connection through stories and photos and, and our imagination. How beautifully stated. So we have three generations, technically, um, of altar makers, you know, uh, invoking your grandmother, yourself, yes. Senora, uh -huh. and Rosana. Mm -hmm. And you said that there are other family members that have participated in making the altares with you? Yeah, uh, my niece, some nieces and uh, nephews uh, have helped with the altar, you know, and, and I know they probably have a little, you know, little something in their homes, you know, so it, it's, you know, bringing it along, bringing it along for sure. And how would you say, have you seen in terms of the tradition of altar making here in East Los Angeles evolve over time? Was it something very visible as we see now? How was it for you when you were... Actually, it wasn't. It was, uh, my experience was only at home. And, and at church, but at church it was um, in my very early days. I was born in 1932. My early years, I remember altares, but for the other Los Muertos, it wasn't like my mother's uh, description of what she did at home. Now, we didn't have calaveras at all, uh, but we, always the photographs, always the flowers. My mother grew her own flowers. Many times it was all in white, because that's the flower she grew. And, uh, she did have um, Simpal Suchi. She called him Simpuales. I guess it's a short name for Simpal Suchi. And, um, but those were the colors and calla lilies. They were oh, always yeah. part of her altars. And so it was a private and personal thing at home. I didn't see any of this uh, of outside of the home. But in my experience, my mother, we, there's lots of cemeteries here in East Lake because it was the outskirts at the turn of the century or even onto the 20th century. Uh, one of the cemeteries, the Catholic cemeteries, she and my aunts would gather their bags, we'd walk to the cemetery. And I think of the stories of people in small towns in Mexico, how they take all their tilichis and go to the cemetery. And she would take a lunch for all of us and the, my cousins and I would play jumping the gravestones, and then she would, they would call us, and then they had a spread of the food there. We would eat it, and the stories of who was buried there. At that time, we didn't have any very close relatives, but they were paisanos or cousins who had come to the U.S. a long time before. But that brought up the stories of their hometown, her mother, since it was my mother's cousin, not only the, of who they were, but how they lived and how they celebrated the songs they sang. So those were my beginning stories for Day of the Dead. They would decorate the, you know, with what it, a few flowers they brought, but the main part for me was listening to the stories. I was fascinated. And then we would eat. And while we were eating, we had esta fulana de tal, hacía unas gorditas de horno que mi mamá, and so the story, it would, Continue. Did, the stories didn't end, and so that was my first experience of celebrating the other words. Then we go home to my mother's little altar, but it was something that had been there all year, but it was dressed up and perked up, you know, with flowers. And the stories—that's what the special part of it. And so it wasn't until uh, 1979 that I first went to Self Help Graphics. They had started celebrating a community, uh, a public celebration of the other Miss Marcos. And there's a whole story behind that. I'm sure you'll get that. It's a long story, but, but I came on um, a part of the neighborhood, part of the community, and uh, they were, uh, there was a sign asking for instructors for the workshops for Day of the Dead. And I said, I didn't know they had a Day of the Dead celebration out here because uh, when I went there, Sister Karen asked me, uh, are you familiar with the other Los Muertos? And I told her that story, so okay, you're, you're hired. And so we did wonderful things. We did huge headdresses for a procession that would take place from the cemetery, Evergreen Cemetery, which was not the same one that I used to go to, but not far. 
and two cell phone graphics in a procession, and they would make we made these huge headdresses, and there were some giant um, paper mache calacas that would be carried to the cemetery, laid there, and then have some kind of ceremony, and uh, then we process back to. Uh, to self graphics and then there was a celebration of vendors and music and all that. So that was the beginning of these big celebrations for the other Muertos at self graphics In the late 70s. In the yes. late I think in the US, era. right? Right. Yeah. right. Actually, it was, they started just further away uh, from where I, I came out in 1973. They moved to to that building near my house on Caesar Chavez. Then it was Brooklyn Avenue and Gage Avenue. And I, I think it was 79, 76, but I, but I didn't come, I started doing altars there in 1980 and 81. They were all community altars. It wasn't like in the, my individual altar, but it was part of many artists coming together, but it was a wonderful experience because the things that I had seen or my mother were magnified because it was the stage and everything was big because so many people participated. And that continued to this day. So I became part of that celebration since then. There was a hiatus of about maybe three years because I had just become a teacher, an elementary school teacher. So I, but I started doing that, you know, talking about the other resources in my classroom. In fact, self graphics the artist developed a coloring book. First of its kind, I still have copies of it. So that's what I would you know, pre present to my students. But mostly I would tell them about my own experience. And that's how I would introduce it to them because it was more personal. And so this, I started doing altars in my school of 1970, I guess 78 or nine, and uh, continued for, till I retired in 1999. And you're still active making... I am more active now than ever because actually it's all <laughs> tied to self graphics. When Sister Karen passed away suddenly in 1970, 1997, her, her celebration was huge. Of course, so many people from all over came to, to honor her. And I was asked to do an altar this time on the stage because they had the reception there at South of Graphics. It turned out to be the, a monumental altar with so many flowers and uh, artifacts that artists brought, you know, many kinds of artifacts, small paintings, big paintings, and it was such a, such a response of respect and love for her from many sectors that it, the altar, what started as a, what I thought was going to be, you know, a normal size, all became monumental. But then I, it, many of the artists were, I, were, I engaged in, they started, you know, adding things and I would just direct by the, by the time it was done, you know, had, uh, it was beautiful. And I have beautiful photographs of it. I hope I have one here, but, but it was, the beginning of these monumental altars that I have started building, because in subsequent years, I uh, was asked to do one of the community altar on the stage. But previous to that, I had been doing altars, uh, like I said, back in 1980, 81, as part of the art exhibits, where I would do my own personal altars. And uh, usually I used a piece of furniture, because I, in my, vision, it was like doing a home altar, something you would do at home. And so I still incorporate uh, furniture in, in, um, in many of the altars. And that's when my, my children started to in, engage in, in, these, in these altars. The young ones would just do flowers because I would make, we would make so many tissue making flowers. I learned all these flower making, uh, skills from my mother. She was an artisana who did everything with paper. And so it was just, it just came a wonderful, a natural thing to make things for the altar. And, and then it, it also it was an art piece. So all, the, all these years, it is an art form today, of course, but it's also a cultural thing, a tradition, a spiritual thing. And so I think all these 
of this combination is what I love to do. And um, my, one of my mother's wishes was that I carry on these traditions, not just for the other ones, but for the nacimientos and all these other things. And it's come to fruition. My daughter, Rosana, Elena, uh, Denise has helped quite a bit. Her, our, their children making the flowers and sometimes helping us, you know, with placing things. But my son, Javier, who does the foundations, who hangs up and he can construct anything that I draw for him. Because uh, in the early days, I would say, well, could you move this here? Could you hang this here? He says, can you just draw me a picture? Then I have an idea. So from then on, I started doing these schematics. And they became more and more elaborate as I was given bigger spaces. But what I really love is to make community altars such as these, where my children are involved and where the community comes in. Because that's really what the, the other Los Muertos is all about. So I love the idea and what we do and what self Graphics started doing many years ago with me. It's not called Noche de Ofrenda, where you really focus on the altar, its meaning, its significance, its spirituality, and it's about the, the, the people who have passed. And I look forward to that. And we're having ours uh, the second so November 2nd. Well, I would love to learn a little bit um, about how you do and make these community altares or your altares that you have in dedication to past loved ones here at the studio, would you mind sharing a little bit of how you make your altares and envision them and what elements are important in making an altar? Well, I, 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 the basic elements is what, that I have learned and that I employ are you know, the, photo, first of all, the photographs and the flowers and especially the marigold but other flowers are 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 you know are are fine. Um, I like to use related colors because, of course, the visual, the aesthetic of it all. Um, and then uh, the, a candle and uh, incense, uh, preferably copal, which is a traditional ceremonial incense, and it was used in ancient times. Um, and I, for me, it's fundamental to have an arco and arch. My mother would say that's the gateway to the, to the ofrenda and lets the, the, the soul know that we are, that it's here to come and partake of, of, the, of the ofrenda. And of course, yeah, in most food and drink, water, because they came from a long way, they're thirsty. And those are the basic elements for me. And it's interesting because when I was te uh, te teaching, I would ask parents of my students. Some had never had this uh, tradition in their family, although they were aware of the other los todos santos and the other ones, uh, de las santos almas. But some of them had different ideas about how, uh, but I accepted and I wanted to learn as much. And I think I've incorporated many, many uh, traditions or styles. Uh, and it also depends on the theme or the vision I have for that year because I, they're never the same. And although in this altar here I have used this idea before, I wanted to do it in, in this space because it was very special when I first did this ofrenda to the women in my family. Uh, it was quite emotional for me at that time, and it is again. And um, so it has a lot of symbolism for me. Uh, and then, and something very interesting, yesterday a teacher from the high school came in. He had wanted to bring his students here to visit and for me to talk to them. And he says, well, if, you, if, they, if, I, if I can't bring them, I did find a site on, on the internet that says the basic things for an altar. And it was a list of about 10 things and he gave me the, the site and I said, one of them was, you have to have the things I mentioned, but you have to have orange paper for the Aztecs and purple paper, purple uh, flowers for the Catholic Church. He said, I had never heard of that before. Well, it's, it's in here, this, in, this, uh, in this list, and it's from Mexico. And I said, well, you know, I, I imagine that there's some people places somewhere where this is a practice. Uh, oh, I didn't say it, but you know, the tradition of, 
offerings for the dead comes way behind. You know, in the ancient times before the conquest. But it's interesting because many people have a certain way. And I say, did you put, oh, they'll ask me, there's four tiers for each. And I, I, I kind of go along with that for each phase of our life. And the top one is when you're in heaven. So it's the photograph of the, of the, of the deceased person. And then there's the, some that, but in Yucatan, there's many, there's about 10 tiers. I think it's a matter of, of maybe aesthetics or where the spaces you have to want so many things in it because for me, I like it to be full of things and full of color. And so we that, especially when we do large um, uh, monumental altars, there's got to be enough room, enough tiers. But I think basically having four, three or four tiers is, is what makes an altar. But I, I am not, I say, I'm not the expert. It's what people want to do or in their, in their own family or in their own region. That's their tradition. And I think that's what you should go by. There's no right way. I look at ancient uh, you know, narratives. I look at my mother's way. I look at what some people have done around me, especially from Mexico with their family tradition. And I, I love them all, so I use, I incorporate some some of them into my altars. And some are non-traditional, like this bed and the one that you're going to see now that Rosanna did. But I, the most important thing is the meaning, the spiritual spirituality behind it, and the respect and, and the heart that you have for it. That's the most important thing. Thank you. No, I think that's beautiful. Um, because you're right, I was actually at um, a Oaxaqueño Baker's location and they had orange and purple flowers um, at the front of their home. Mm -hmm. And so, and also to, placed by their altar. So yeah, every region within Mexico or Central or South America have their different traditions. And so you're and, definitely correct. And you know, that's interesting because here in Oaxaca, it's one of the cradle of uh, celebrating making ofrendas and but they're honoring the Catholic tradition with the, the purple colors. Mm -hmm. so it's, I mean it's inclusive of everybody. My but hair must be uh, yes. honoring the Catholic Church. I have yes. no idea. <laughs> right. You have to wear some some orange flowers. <laughs> there we go. Because we identify with the so the Can indigenous I, roots. Yeah. Yeah. Can yes, I add to it? Definitely. Uh, one, there's a couple really good examples of the process that we go through. Um, uh, we did an altar in, I think it was 2008, um, for my grandparents, my Mama Lupe and Papa. And they were travelers. They loved to travel to Mexico as often as they could. And so we wanted to kind of capture that and their travels from Iglan to home. And, and we, we did an altar at Self Help Graphics and we had steamer trunks, we had kind of a setting where they would be changing their clothes or packing their suitcases and uh, photos of them at Bail de Lacan, you know, all the, the, the sites and they're together, or one's taking a picture of the other or my, my grandfather holding my grandmother's purse, you know, while he's like waiting. It's just like really, Beautiful photographs, old photographs, yeah, and passports. and then uh, their passports and postcards with their lit letters writing home. It was so beautiful. So that's one aspect where you're honoring uh, people that you love, but it's an aspect of their life. You know, um, you can grab something and just you know say, "Oh, my grandmother was such a great cook. I'm going to make a kitchen." you know, or something like that. Um, the other thing that's more conceptual is uh, we did one called Ode to the Old Barrio, uh, which is the block where we live, and self-help graphics is part of that. And all the storefronts, the you know, when, when my mom was growing up, and, and I got a taste of a lot of it, you know, in the 60s up until the 70s. And so 
you know, the building that Self Help Graphics used to be in was partial, partially a mortuary. You know, there was a like prosthetics. You know, there was all kinds of stuff going on in there, and um, we took photos, or we, we grabbed photos as many as we could of the original spaces, and we made those the highlights of the altar and the building of self-help graphics. It was really cool. And if I can get you photos, I'll, I'll get you Definitely. photos. Yeah, really cool. So it, I think the, the feel that the, um, the intent is to honor and to not forget. So you just start from there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, speaking of that, the intent and to honor, would you be willing to show me some of the altares and ofrendas that you have created in honor of several family members or friends sure. and, and mujeres that are, and others that are very important? Thank you, yes. I'll move that with you. Let's start with this one. Actually, it's still in progress because we're having our Noche de Ofrenda on Monday the second. But it's dedicated. I call it para las mujeres de mi alma. Uh, I have to add more photographs because there's many women who I want to honor. My comadre, my I have my sister, a couple of aunts, and some dear friends, my husband's. Uh, mother and, and grandmother. But I I love this I, idea of having the bed. Of course, her, her uh, arco is the headboard. And a few of the things that, she, that were hers, but mostly the photographs and the, but I, and some of her linens are part of this that I have saved. But I think the, the bedroom for a mother is uh, a very, if not sacred, a very special place for her children, for her too. The place where uh, you find support, comfort, and and just just uh, closeness. And so I felt that for my mother, I I would love to hold her again. <laughs> and although she's been gone like 22 years, it is emotional because uh, I feel her presence always. And I guess I could tell you, and I don't know if you, I always end with this saying that she taught me, and that's the reason that the essence of doing an altar for those you love, for remembering them, is how they were loved more than anything else. Anyway, so th this is all part of it, and uh, recreating a, an, a, actually a home space, a home place, where, where you, where at home is the most intimate place for an altar, and you remember. Sometimes, some people have them all year long, but they're just special, and they're during this time, and you bring out all the photographs that you can. And so that's what this is. Thank you. Just a special note. Uh, all these um, vegetables are from a garden that was is built. Uh, it's actually like a community garden on the property next to where we, we played that would belong to my mother. And it was full of nopales and uh, magueyes. She always had to have nopales and magueyes in her yard. You know, she came to this country, but my brother would say, pero se trajo su tierra. So she loved her country and her customs and her traditions, and that's why I, why I learned them. She taught them to us. and. It became, it's become part of my life, and so they were beautiful uh, concepts of nature, of love, of respecting, of, of growing things, of the land. And so here she brought it to East LA. <laughs> so beautiful, thank you so much. <laughs>